Hey, uh, glad you're here. Um, you guys like impersonations? Yeah. yeah. All right, this is, um, this was Russell Crowe. to Boys Bible Study. It's a very special episode. Thank you for two years of BBS. You're welcome. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> Woohoo! I'm Ash. I'm here with... Scott. And Julian. Well, boys, we did it. Another lap around the old manger, you know? <laughs> Another lap toward the star in Bethlehem. Yeah. Another year closer to heaven. Yeah, <laughs> that's for sure. We d- we did a year roundup last year around this time, and I kind of went over the the legend of our origins, uh, you know, which isn't terribly exciting. But um, just to remind, you know, the show started out from uh, weekly movie nights that we would do, uh, where we had a group chat called Boys Bible Study, uh, and we could not believe when the name was actually completely available on uh, online. <laughs> so we took it and actually turned that into a show. And we, our first episode was around Christmas of 2019. And we actually started updating for real uh, in the first week of January, 2020. So I consider the new year, basically the start of, of when our anniversary is. So it's been two years of Boys Bible Study, and we're back again with uh, just sort of like a meta discussion of what we covered this year. Because it's just it's just really interesting to look back and 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 see everything. So, um, you know, we're going to be naming a lot of movies in this episode. Uh, we're going to try to put in clips. So, you know, if you haven't seen them, if you're listening, you still can hopefully gain some context. But, you know, hopefully it won't be too overwhelming with the material. It'll be a nice, like, way to jump in. So let's just say that we started our 2021 season with a spotlight on a guy who's just an all-time legend. We, we basically spent most of January and February watching David A.R. White movies. I don't get what you're doing, Lord. That's supposed to be... A great man, a leader. I feel like I'm nothing. I'm ordinary. I'm miserable. Help me to be the man you want me to be. Anybody except who I am. Not that we need to get all into his story, but um, who again is is David A. R. White, and and why is he like so important to our canon? White History Month. <laughs> we, <laughs> yeah. we did, oh, you could say White History Month uh, to <laughs> kick off 20, uh, <laughs> the 2021 season. Um, you could say that. You could say that, technically. Um, but yeah, we watched we watched f- six. We, we did five movies of his in a row. Um, the movies that we did were Me Again, End of the Harvest, Second Glance, Mercy Streets, and uh, the Revelation Road trilogy, where we actually got to speak to uh, our new friend uh, Gabriel Sabloff, the the director of this trilogy. Which Hi, is Gabriel. Really cool. um, I wonder if he still listens. Can you hear the wind? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. Can yeah. you see the? What is it? Can you see the wind? You yeah, can hear can the you, wind oftentimes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The wind's got a see. great podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well. Um, you know, uh, he's the great yeah. white hope. Yeah, shout out to Gabriel Sabloff, though. He really is probably the best Christian action director. I would say so. I mean, it's amazing what he accomplished in in Revelation Road. Like, that's a really high concept, you know. I mean, low budget as far as the scheme of movies go, but, you know, they had enough to work with that they could be, like, crashing cars and stuff. Yeah. And if you get to listen back to our interview with him, I mean... I remember him saying that there were times when they were like pushing cars for long distances because like a really cool old car broke down and they had to do all these like, 
you know, just pretty amazing feats of strength and engineering to get these effects from the movies. Yeah, like shoot an entire car chase in one day. Yes. Like some like, good old fashioned filmmaking. Yeah. Yes, like true. Italian police. None of these green style. screens and uh Baby Yodas. <laughs> well, honestly, yeah. yes. Okay, I feel like you're mixing things there, Julian. <laughs> like we can have one and not the other. Well, not if you put the Yoda on the green screen, then they're mm. both going to yeah, disappear. That's true. Yeah, that's a big problem with filming Star Wars. There, that's were why it was delayed that. for so long. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> it was really tough to work with Yoda. Because, yeah, yeah, the fucking space patterns would appear on his face every yeah. time they were filming. <laughs> um, yeah, but but David A. R. White, you know, as we know. Founder of Pure Flix, uh, the name in Christian films that everybody knows, Pure Flix, the Christian streaming service and production company. Also, the star of many Christian movies, all the way back to when he was a teen uh, into now when he's an established Christian movie star. But in this year, we watched his first starring role. We watched Second Glance. Yeah. With our friend Hank Friedman came mm-hmm. on the show and watched Second Glance with us, which is like, you know, one of the most iconic like Christian movie performances of all time. Jesus man. Jesus man. Hey Scotty. Jesus man. And we watched stuff as recently, not in our initial streak, but during this year, we watched God's Not Dead. Uh What's the new one called? We the people. We the God's not dead. We the people, which was like a brand new yeah. David Arrow White performance. So we really like ran the gamut of his entire career. Personally, not I was not a big fan of it. Spoiler yeah. for awards later, but um, he was great in it. He did his, a yeah. good job as always. He always does. Like he's just so good at going in there and doing the work and being a convincing leading man. I mean. It's it's a subject that we've we've discussed his life's work work at length on the podcast. Um, it will certainly not be the last time we speak about him. Um, also, spoilers: a category in our wrap up award ceremony this year is going to be our favorite day, David A. R. White movie Yay. of the year. So we don't have to decide that right now. Awesome. But um, I just I think it was a good exercise for us to go through to like really spend the first part of the year digging into his catalog. And, you know, we could do another fucking month and still not have fully dug into his work. There's some great ones we haven't touched yet. I know. What's your, uh, what, what's one of his that we haven't done that you think we should do next in the blink of an eye. I still haven't seen that one. It's a time loop movie. Ooh, that's really good. It's very, uh, honestly a unique take on time loop because, um, I don't even know if I want to say why, but it's it feels it feels different than other ones I've seen. Wow. That's very exciting. It's very cool. Well, you know, uh, in the second half of this program, we're going to do the second annual Boys Bible Study Golden Calf Awards, which is like our Oscars. So uh, we'll actually pick our favorite David A. R. White movie of the year among many other awards. Best actor, best picture, best director. So, you know we can get a little deeper into the specifics of what we watched this year. Um, one other, one yes, other guest I want to mention, we had Anthony Benua Simon on for a week, me again, uh, who famously edited, directed pure flicks and chill, yeah. which, uh, in our opinion is the definitive piece on, um, David A. R. White's history so far. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah, hopefully uh, everyone who's listening got to hear that episode. If you're new to the show, definitely check it out. Listen to our interview with Anthony and and watch his film because it's very uh, it's something that was very inspiring to us as we made the show. It's called Pure Flix and Chill, a great like found footage um, compendium of David A.R. White's career. So yeah, uh, his newest performance, God's Not Dead, We the People, um, made me think of that I, I wanted to go back over the newest films we watched this year in 2021. You know, we we try to stay somewhat on trend. You know, we, we want to look at what happened in the past, but also what's happening right now in Christian cinema. Of course, We the People was one of those, but there were actually two other 2021 films we watched this year. Um, these were... The Girl Who Believes in Miracles. Sarah, the bird is dead. Nothing can bring him back. 
Lazarus was dead for four days and Jesus brought him back to life. But Jesus isn't here and the bird isn't Lazarus. God is always here. Well, I don't see him. But we have to have faith in miracles. Remember that one? Was that was that all three of us, or was that just... No, I still haven't watched it. Ah, oh, that's all right. No. That was yeah. you and me, Julian. Yeah, um, that was cool. That was like the J.C. Penny God or Jesus or whatever yeah. he was. <laughs> yeah, that was that was had like white fucking Jesus in that movie, right? Yeah, like, the whitest yeah, Jesus like, you know. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. in 2021, it was just amazing. Um, also, uh, Kevin Sorbo cameo in that film, which was yeah. great. And um, as a magical kid movie, it seemed yes. like the I believe of this year. Yeah, it was. You know, it it was a little too polished to really have the same charm as I believe. There were some amazing moments, though. I mean, I know you you will love it once you get to watch it. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's it's worth seeing. I don't think, and also I know how much you love the movie. I believe, Scott. Um, I'm sure yes. it remains to this day uh, one of your faves that we've watched. One of my favorite movies. Period. Like, unbelievable <laughs> movie. Yeah, uh, we watched that in our in our first year. Um, so everyone, please check that out. But yeah, Girl Who Believes in Miracles. I I can't say it was as creative as that, but there there were some pretty insane moments, right? Um, yeah, I. Re- call like a mass healing of children on the front lawn <laughs> yeah and it i'm not i don't want to spell too much for scott but she can heal children and it does drain her own life yes, force i remember yeah. that very clearly from <laughs> y'all's episode it's so sick it's so fucking yeah. sick dude yeah. i love when a little girl's like i see this horse girl in my dreams i'm going to heal her and then she like collapses on the floor (laughs) it's it's really cool like so okay that movie is pretty dope actually um (laughs) uh girl who believes in miracles directed by richard carell um mir sorvino is also mia sorvino is also in that movie and kevin sorbo very cool um another 2021 film we watched is kind of uh doesn't count because it was like a weird reissue uh do you remember mike norris's film the end of days global catastrophe oh yeah yeah, yeah. they re-edited the opening i think that was what we figured out <laughs> that yeah. was what they changed yeah. very very little and changed it the was title. like yeah they just changed the very beginning i think to say like there's a, a global pandemic or whatever. yes or no they cut in like footage from black lives matter protests <laughs> right. yeah <laughs> right and like anti-police protests right into um, the beginning and that was the only thing they changed yeah we it we, worked we clicked on it we because we were intrigued by the title and of course mike norris son of chuck was directing but we did find out through our research that it was originally released in 2019 under the title the crossroads of hunter wilde Right. Yeah, that's not Hunter as good Wild. a title. No, they really cleaned it up a bit with the end of days. Hunter uh, Wild, I barely even know her wild. <laughs> <laughs> Calm down. <laughs> Calm down over there. Yeah. That you know what? That movie was really fun. Probably not my favorite one we watched this year, but it it had some great parts. It was slow to watch, but uh fun to look back on. <laughs> hate to see it go but i'd love to watch it walk yeah. away <laughs> yeah it was a uh, i liked it because it was very like stephen king the stand ish yeah that's true <laughs> With, like you know end of days and then like oh uh, the devil's meddling and there's a, a character that has some sort of you know mental cognition it error error mental <laughs> cognition issue and they're seen as like some sort of seer of right you know, the truth. And this, this seer of the truth only says like, we have to listen to Mike Norris and whatever he yeah, does. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like it just, which is also a great like aspect of the Every movie. Every time my uncle sundowns, he says, we have to listen to Hunter Wilde and everything he says. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and like that one was really funny because he was really mad at, he like went out into the plague lands or came, oh, yeah. and something and came back and he was like, I'm not infected. So, How did this happen? Just find a girl wandering out there. Look, she's been living on her own. Her whole family had some sort of disease and her dad's been- Wait, what? What disease? I don't know. Mumps, Ebola, measles, I I don't know. So you're telling me that you just put this entire town at risk of extinction? 
She doesn't have it. How do you know, Hunter? She's got no one, and I killed her father. Look, and they yeah. were like, <laughs> and they were like, like what the fuck? You can't just go into the plague and come back in. And, yeah. And it was, it was like, like why? I needed fitting. to get out for a ride. Or yeah, whatever yeah. he said. Yeah. No, he, he was literally like, I needed to clear my head. It, like, it's fine. Yeah. And they were like, yeah. you can't just come back in here. Like, you're going to kill us all. <laughs> it was so oddly prescient. Yeah. Yeah, about absolutely. like you know a certain type of person's attitude during COVID nineteen, <laughs> like I kind of couldn't believe how on the nose it was. It was really <laughs> special. Um, so you know that was the like the twenty twenty one. Uh, that's the scene happening right now. There's so many we miss. There's some that I know we want to cover in the next couple weeks as well. Of course, um, there's new movies every day. True. My most anticipated has got to be. Oh God, I f- forgot the fucking title. The youngest evangelist. Oh, oh yeah. yeah, we're gonna yeah. we're gonna have to do that one. We're soon, definitely gonna do that one. And also, actually, we should have thought of this when we were talking David A. R. White. We missed uh, Love on the Rocks because we couldn't figure out how to watch the VOD channel. It was- <laughs> 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 but that looks like a pretty cool action movie. Once that's that available does. to us, we're gonna watch that one for sure. Um, but you know, uh, we didn't just want to stay going on with what's right now because you know we we want to be good students of the genre we want to survey it from all decades and we actually watched two films from the 60s this year the oldest films mm-hmm. we watched um the first one was the short they're both short films um the first one is ant keeper by director Rolf Forsberg whom we love yes um, ant keeper i barely even know her <laughs> <laughs> and the eggs hatch and the larvae grow to spin cocoons, and the young emerge weakly. And when they've discovered that their legs are for walking and their antennae for speaking, they discover something more. Unfolding from their bodies are wings. The Ant Keeper, uh, which is about uh, ants seeing humans as if they were gods, and this is sort of an allegory for how we are as humans in relation to God. You know, we are... It was actually kind of a cool allegory because it's yeah. like, you know, it's so easy to think of God as as another guy, but uh, that's not true. Just Weird, a guy really. you can have a couple yeah. beers with. Just an ant you can have a couple <laughs> beers yeah, with. Yeah, like a guy you know? I can have a beer with. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that was cool. Uh, we also watched, uh, I think this was just Scott and I watched this one, but we watched Johnny Lingo from 1969 mm-hmm. that film sticks in my head like i there's something about that fi- i understand why it's like sticks in a lot of people it heads. really yeah. does three cows is many but not enough for mahana i will pay eight cows <laughs> I will bring them in the morning. Johnny Lingo is a short film from 1969 that I believe is filmed in Hawaii. And it's basically deals with this uh, fictitious island culture where there's a custom that, um, you know, women are basically sold off to their prospective husbands like it's like a dowry system and it involves cows and the number of cows you can be bought with uh determines your your worth in the tribe and um johnny lingo sees a woman who is you know to to him she's beautiful but she's considered sort of plain to the rest her of the hair tribe. is in her face right she's exactly quiet. she stays in the shadows Right, basically the the teen movie trope of you know she has her glass once she takes her glasses off she's beautiful right. but in this case you know set among um, a, a fictitious uh, in indigenous island culture um, and Johnny Lingo buys her for eight cows unprecedented an unprecedented eight cows why buy the cows when you can have the milk for free <laughs> <laughs> but teach a, a teach a man to milk, milk eight cows wait give a man. <laughs> Uh, eight cows worth of milk and he drinks for you know eight days 
Eight days a week. <laughs> That's what the Beatles was yeah. always about. <laughs> Did y'all know there's a, a Shirley y'all talk, talked about the legend of Johnny Lingo, the 2003 film. We did. And we I did. really want to watch it. Maybe that's one of my I resolutions. Think that should for be a yeah. new yeah. resolution. Yeah, yeah. We should watch that. We got to watch that this year for yeah, sure. Yeah, it's the like, like teen. It's so funny because you watch Johnny Lingo and it's like from the 60s and it's this like fucking dry and super weird and racist and sexist like 60s <laughs> yeah. movie that somehow we found this out julian somehow everyone we know who grew up christian was like shown this in church uh yeah. someone wrote to us on patreon i'm sorry i can't i can't remember your name but someone wrote to us on patreon and said that um they were shown this in like a, a church like it was like sessions for couples who were soon to be married. Yeah. I don't even think it was Mormon. I think it was. Right. It was a yeah. Catholic. Yeah. I think this person said yeah, they were yeah. Catholic. Right. Right. Wow. And um, so this film really was like seen by a lot of Christians. It was like distributed really well and seen by a lot of Christians. And yeah. Yeah. They made a cute like teen movie like sequel to it. Like isn't living on an island fun? Like, yeah. No rules. Like, <laughs> it's really funny. Imagine running wild on a tropical island. No school, no homework, no rule. So we get to watch it uh, one day. Yeah, um, I don't even know how Christian it, it is. Um, I'm sure it's very Christian. Yeah, it probably is. Um, but one of the things we learned about why it was so well distributed at the time and then forevermore is because it was directed by the head of Brigham Young University's video department at the time. Oh wow! I see. Yeah. Inside I see. track. Yep. I'm sure I learned that uh, when we were talking about it, but I just learned it again. Amazing. <laughs> it's all about who you know. Uh -huh. Yep. <laughs> it's true. Um, you know, speaking of Brigham Young and Mormonism, we finally this year dug into Mormon cinema a little bit. That was something we completely neglected on our first lap. And it was really cool. Honestly, the episode where you introduced us to your friend Daniela yep. and we had her on, that was probably one of my like top five or whatever favorite episodes we did this year. Like fascinating. She she was yeah, such a great was guest, wild. and the, the all her stories were fascinating. I learned so much about Mormonism. That was great. Um, all the different levels of heaven uh, was like that really blew my mind. Yeah. yeah. Also, if, if you did not uh, listen to this episode, dear listeners, pause this and <laughs> listen to it right now. <laughs> It's a, it's a blast. Like we, we get into the movie Passage of Zarahemla, which was a really fun film. I I really liked it. Uh, yeah. But you know, even more than that, like we we got so caught up in asking Daniela questions about like the Mormon <laughs> faith and like her own upbringing, which is in particular very interesting because her father's like one of the most famous and influential like black Mormons, if I remember correctly. Yeah, I like think he was the first black graduate of the law program. At, yeah. Uh, I want to say Brigham Young, but I, I might so. I might be missing something like that. that. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Anyone listening who yeah. hasn't heard that episode should check it out because because Daniela was great. Fascinating stuff. Yeah. But um, yeah, passage. Oh, we learned about the yeah. store. That was yeah. crazy to me. The Mormon What's thrift the, store. Yeah, yeah. What is it called? Desiree. Fuck. Desiree. Desiree. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, I know it well. <laughs> it's a great thrift store. Wow. <laughs> You probably bought many of VHS tape there. I'm sure that's where I got Johnny Lingo. <laughs> probably. I didn't realize yeah. that they have like their own brand, like Kirkland, but for Mormons. That's yeah. Desert, Desert Land. Industries. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so cool. Worlds within worlds. Truly. Yeah. And I mean, the movie was just the same. Worlds within worlds. Uh, yeah. It was. Yeah, that's true. That was literally what Passage to Zarahemla is about. It's about this like. Yeah, a uh, weird like alternative like time travel zone you can get to if you um, go click there through the and wall. Kill indigenous and, and, uh, people. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, you can you can go hunting there if if you if, <laughs> clip through the wall. Yeah, if, if you if you go into a, a home where someone has eleven kids or more and you sort of walk against the northwest wall and you can clip through it at just the right point and you end up in Zarahemla. That's like essentially the plot of the yeah. movie. I'm editorializing, of course. Hey, did you still talk to that Donny kid? Huh? Kid Donnie, your imaginary friend? Oh, that's what I remember most about you. You used to spend hours talking to him. Yeah, well, I made all that up. Well, duh. It's not like I thought you believed he was real. Like Donnie the Kid? Was he a cowboy? Oh, no, he was a boy. A magical boy, right, Kira? But uh, pretty cool stuff. Um, and uh, yeah, and uh, there's so many more Mormon movies out there, obviously. But 
I don't know. I didn't really feel qualified to talk about them. And I mean, I'm I'm still not, but <laughs> now that we got a really good intro, I, I definitely have like a bit more vocabulary for engaging with their stuff. So um hey, you know, maybe look forward to more of those this year. That would be really fun. One other movie from not quite the 60s, but pretty close to that time we covered was Wakefield Pool's The Bible. Yes. Uh from well, 1973. That was, cool. that was a fascinating those film. little blue people. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. That was awesome. It was. It was uh, Avatar. You know, James Cameron owes Wakefield Pool a fucking check. Yeah. <laughs> and I think probably technically, technically, quote unquote, not Christian based on what our normal standards are. Mm-hmm. But it was very biblical. Oh, one of the most biblical that we watched. It was just straight up retellings of Bible stories. However, um, in an erotic uh, 70s art house way that was typical of big budget, um, well, relatively big budget, like softcore porn films yeah. of the time, which yeah, was amazing. Not so softcore porn right. as well. Right. It's true. Um, we had, what was his name? Joe Rubin? Yeah, Joe Rubin. Yeah, we had Joe Rubin. Co-founder of, of Vinegar Syndrome. Vinegar Syndrome on to introduce the movie to us, which that was another really fascinating conversation for me. Um, it's just so cool how much Joe knows about like pornography. Yes. Like I love, I mean, I <laughs> too like love smut and porno. Um, don't know nearly as much about it as Joe, but I love how Joe would just like very academically and like, uh, you know, almost like, I know he is very passionate about it, but the, his mannerism is very sort of like dispassionate. And he was just kind of yeah. very like <laughs> going through like all this like history of, of porno. And it was, I found it extremely fascinating. Whoa. So. Very specifically religious porno. Yes. Yeah. Listeners. He knew a lot about it. Yeah. And Wakefield pool passed away at the end of October. No. What? This year. Oh, yeah. Wow. Oh man. October 27th. As, as, President Trump once said, you're telling me this for the first time. This is the first time I'm hearing this. Um, <laughs> that's really sad, out. you know? Seriously, um, RIP to a legend, like Wakefield Pool, like legendary um, American filmmaker and pornographer. Yeah. And I just think that that era that he was working is like such a fascinating era of American film history. We will never see anything like that again. And I don't remember if we had this information at the time. I don't think we did. But another past guest of ours, uh, Josh, um, who who did the imposter with right. us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, after we put out the episode, he mentioned to me that uh, he did a screening of Bijou, which is one of Wakefield Pool's most famous movies. Hmm. And that in the Q&A, Wakefield Pool said that uh, cocaine saved his life because he was doing so much that he could never be hard. And he feels like uh, he he missed out on getting AIDS because of that. Wow. <laughs> well, that's an incredible story. Wow. Wakefield Pool. Yeah, I mean, that was a very... Um, tragic era for so many gay men it is actually when you do meet like a gay elder from that cultural era and they survived i mean the numbers were really against you at that time so like it's amazing that he did survive and was able to like yeah, tell stories of that new york art house adulthood. scene like that it, uh, it's it, it really amazing that he survived um for so long so i'm very sad to hear about his passing but um yeah Really, uh, really appreciate his work. It was amazing to explore that on the show. Um, actually, you know, I wanted to talk about, you know, I was just going through the list of everything we watched this year and trying to come up with some, you know, like interesting grounds that we treaded. And I actually do think that our picks this year were um, pretty horny. Uh, yeah. You, you think, know, just, do you think that was influenced by st doing uh, Wakefield Pool's Bible so early you know, on? He really could have like started the edging process, and we were just sort of like, uh, you know, just just titillating ourselves uh, for, for the rest of the year. You know, maybe it was that. Maybe it was the constant pulsating pattern of of getting to go out and then stay in, and then go out and then stay in. You know, feeling our freedom, sowing our wild oats, and then. Uh, having to walk back in like like dogs uh, with our tails between our legs maybe that was why but you know yeah we did we did Wakefield pool um do you remember uh when we we watched Rev Bev's videos yeah sex cool. is good that was really cool I 
have no idea how Jesus would respond to Kink. But I do know his central teaching, and that is to love God and your neighbor as yourself. She is this like sex positive reverend um, who uh, we, we watched some of her YouTube videos in this series that she did called Sex is Good, which is like a video art um, and video essay series where she talked about like BDSM and the Bible and like basically had a Christian argument for why it's okay to have sex before marriage. And I don't know, call me a fucking liberal or whatever, but I thought she made really good points or her, the way she talked about sex and love made a lot of sense to me. And, uh, I didn't really see a contradiction between it and, uh, Christianity, you know? Yeah. She was really cool. If any of you know Rev Bev or somebody who does, please put us in touch. I tried to contact her through her website. I did put out a contact request. I, I didn't follow up after that, but she had a place on her website where you could, you know, email her. And, um, I did ask her to speak and, I don't know. I'm just going to guess that maybe she uh, maybe doesn't know how to check that email or something. <laughs> uh, I mean, she knows how to use iMovie, so yeah. clearly, you know, she... And upload things to YouTube. She's, that is a huge She's too busy jump. at Christian orgies to yeah, check I was her she's, email. She's literally too busy getting pussy to come on our <laughs> You're podcast. You're in the wrong DMs, Ash. <laughs> yeah. We did, uh, we did the flip side of that, too, with the whole sex talk. We did. Why not hug the person we're starting to date? It makes us feel warm, close. They're in our personal space, and we like it. Yeah, Joe. so yeah. Ju- you missed out. I missed that one. Yeah, Julian but and I. Well, you know, you I'm could've... sure you lived through it. I mean, <laughs> it was basically sex ed in any school in America. <laughs> yeah, um, with a decidedly Christian bent, but then again all of them did. I guess what was pretty remarkable about this one was that it was made in 2018, but it still said that like homosexuality was dead wrong. Like there was like absolutely oh, that no. was nuts. That yeah. lady, <laughs> this poor lady who, who was like, like, I have urges towards women and I just go to church and I pray Yeah, to make them stop. Yeah. So is it possible to be a Christian and struggle with same sex attractions I have to say yes, because I am a Christian and I still struggle with it, even as a married woman and soon a mom of two. I would go to church each Sunday and hear the sermon about idolatry and about giving God your whole heart. And I'd be screaming at the pastor silently, like, I know, I know. How do I become more Christian to get rid of this? It was yeah, it was just pretty amazing. Kind of She's, scary. Uh, she was like sweating and seemed under like like someone was pointing a gun yeah, at her off Yeah, she seemed screen. like she was being Phil Spectered like yeah. in the moment. It <laughs> well, was hopefully crazy. she's seen Benedetta now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Speaking of movies that we might end up doing for the show, um, I'm down. I'm down. Uh, we we could probably do that one soon, but please, um, Benedetta. Yeah, I just watched it the other night. Amazing. Yeah, oh, maybe great. we could do it for like next week's bonus or something. I don't know, but we'll see. But. Um, no promises, but you know, we're just, we're just talking through it right now, but, uh, you know, uh, Benedetta, maybe that's the perfect cap on like a year of, of horny Christian, uh, f- film because I mean, what a masterpiece, like, um, it, it just came out. If you haven't heard of it, watch the trailer, see the movie. It's the new Paul Verhoeven whom we love, uh, doing a tormented lesbian nun film. Um, which already sounds amazing, but even just saying that is like the tip of the iceberg about what this movie deals with. It's it's really incredible. Yeah, I don't, I don't even know what else to say about it other no. than you should absolutely watch it. Yeah, and um, and yeah, maybe we'll we'll get to do our discussion of it soon. So, um, uh, other films in this sort of like uh, sex and romantic like you know realm, um, we watched. A couple things that had to do with 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 porno actually this year. Um, oh yeah, yeah. Now, not Man, to- that was just on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess. Well, I mean, we did literally watch porno with Wakefield Pool's Bible, but then we watched two films that sort of dealt with uh, with themes of pornography. You remember the short film Fight? Hello. Hey, Luke. Me and my mom just got out of the mall, and I thought I'd call and see how you were doing. 
Um, I'm doing fine. What's wrong, Luke? Nothing. I'm, no, nothing. Nothing's wrong. I'm fine. I'm, you know, getting stuff done. You're messing around on that stupid computer again, aren't you? No. Yes. Yeah. Yep. We watched that one uh, in 2021. It's a, it, it's a short film that allegorically talks about a man preparing for a boxing match. But what this boxing match actually is, is him trying not to watch porno while his wife is out grocery shopping. Yes. On the like family computer yes. in the living room. Yeah. Very, very With Kurt all the Cameron. Open. Yeah. <laughs> very Kurt Cameron and fireproof style. Oh my gosh. We watched fireproof this year. I didn't even think to include that one in the, in the right. anti-porno category, but I wh- forgot that that was this year it with our buds that fixed your movie. Yes. Yeah. Nate and David fixed yeah. your movie. Yeah. We That's had crazy. We had Nate and David the on. I was finally. looking at boats and he got so horny. He, <laughs> Tried to wasn't that what he was looking at? I think he's looking at boats. Oh, yeah. uh, in fireproof. In yeah, fireproof. he's on the computer and you see his screen and it's like looking at boats yeah. and then he yes, which is a Next couple words you know, in boats. He's looking up the works of Wakefield Pool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you're gonna want to put your yeah. boat in a pool and then it's yeah. just natural to Wakefield Pool and then yeah. all of a sudden you give a new meaning to uh, half mast and full mast. <laughs> well, yeah, fireproof. One of the like. Biggest budget, most famous, well, I should say highest earning, most famous, like high profile Christian films. We did watch it this year to finally officially enter it into our canon. And it also deals very explicitly with a man struggling with uh, issues related to pornography and his marriage. Yes. Mm -hmm. Culminating in a cathartic climax where he takes his computer outside and and beats it to death with a baseball bat a la (laughs) office space. Um, there were two things that could have happened. Mm-hmm. So pretty interesting. Uh, Kirk Cameron's Connect uh, as well. Not explicitly about porno, but it was sometimes. There was. Yeah, there was some stuff about some, pornography. Some, it was it's, some actually, young people, unfortunately, made the unfortunate life decision to go on camera talking about overcoming their porn addiction. Oh, right. Yeah. yeah. Yes. One of the things that happens when you look at pornography and the brain responds with uh, dopamine, which is a neurotransmitter that is linked to reward and pleasure. The more that you do it, it takes more and more stimulation to get a similar response in the brain. But to get that same dopaminergic response, that same sort of high, if you will, that they got early on, they've had to move along, just like in drugs. You start with a certain dose of cocaine and you have to move up. Your body gets habituated. Yeah. Kirk Cameron's Connect, uh, I'm actually going to talk, we'll talk about it a little more later because I, I have a, a best nonfiction movie category uh, where we'll be picking our, our favorite in um, and that will be one of the choices. It was a really fun documentary. So fun. It was. A pleasure to watch, even though it uh, was not for your pleasure. No. Um, no. But it was a pleasure to watch. I, I watched it at least twice um, and it's it's just it's just so fucking fun. It's Kirk Cameron LARPs as a, as a warrior dad at the end of it. And, um, at the he, end, oh, I forgot he's, he's about honestly that. like a, a poor man's Ashley Hayes Wright's husband. Yeah. What's his yeah. Name? yeah. 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 David Owen. Right. Yeah, yeah. 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 That's who should have been playing that part. Oh my God. He was born for the role, but, um, yeah, Kirk, at the end of the, this, he, you know, spends a whole film scare tacticing you into, you know, saying that, um, you should take away your your kids' devices, even though you should also get like an Amazon Ring installed so you can like spy on uh, all the undesirables on your street. And then literally the end of the movie is just a commercial for you to get to sell uh, a commercial to sell you Disney's like child home proofing like <laughs> digital device that like monitors. Oh, yeah, this thing was wild. It was really crazy. Like you watch this whole movie that's about like how to raise like, you know, your kids in the digital age as a Christian. At the end, they're trying to literally sell you an electronic made by the Disney <laughs> company. Um, bizarre film. Um, was there like a guy who was like tracking down predators online yes. in that movie? Yeah. 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 Cause someone was talking to his son on Facebook chat or something. <laughs> uh, yeah. Like a coach, like a high school coach. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. God. Good movie. Um, yeah, you know, so this is to say that we had a pretty horny year, I would say overall. Um, 
Uh, not to mention, you know, other people like we watched that movie Old Fashioned, yeah. uh, which is about a man who refuses to even stand in the same room as a woman <laughs> alone uh, <laughs> until he's he's married to her. Seriously? What's your deal, stress boy? Please don't take it personally. It's just I made a promise to never be alone with any woman that's not my wife. Oh, that's sweet. I think. Is she the jealous type? Oh, I'm not married. Engaged? No. Living together? Dating? No, I don't date. I have a theory about that. So who'd you make this promise to? Old-fashioned, huh? Yeah. Which is his own rule that he made up and decided is the way you should do stuff. It's yeah. not even old-fashioned. It's just a thing he made up. It strikes yep. me that strikes me somehow as the horniest possibility of any of these movies. Like that is like basically as horny as it gets. That's a good point. He's just so horny. Yes. Like the horniest. So, you know, I think that's what's so interesting about uh Christianity in general or just like any kind of religious restraint in general. And I mean, I think this is what like Benedetta was all about is that like how just horny the restraint of of religious uh, thought is and all the tension that comes into, you know, having an innate sexuality and, and trying to restrain that. So one of the many big important themes in Benedetta, one of the many, like one of the hundreds of themes of that movie. So <laughs> but then similarly in pitching love and catching faith, we have mm-hmm. a protagonist that will not kiss anyone until He's he knows they're in it for serious. Yeah, that was an interesting shared theme of those two films that we watched this year. Men who, uh, for lack of a better phrase, go their own way, I guess you could say. <laughs> um, men who decide that they want to distinguish themselves from the, the stereotype of the of the of the horny guy by actually being very puritanical and virginal and saying, no, I will not kiss a woman. I will not even be in the same room as a woman unless I'm married to her. Which was also his own rule that he made up yep. when he was in some club with his friends when he was nine and they all agreed to not <laughs> right. kiss anyone until they found the right woman. <laughs> yeah, And unbelievably, he was the only one who kept up on that. You may find it odd, but let me tell you the real reason he hasn't kissed. When we were growing up, Ty and his friends had this club. You know, the kind where no girls are allowed. And they each swore they wouldn't kiss until they found that special girl. Well, all of the other guys had broken their pact. Except for Ty. And his sister was very proud of him, right? Yeah. Uh Uh-huh. But she was also really trying to like set him up with people too. It's very strange. Oh, yeah. Oh, that was technically Mormon as well, although not as uh, really not as strongly Mormon oh, right. as Passage to Zarahemla, where you have like it's shot in Utah, right? That's right. Yeah. Wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. A bit Mormon. So yeah, yeah. A very horny year, 2021. Um, you know, we'll see what 2022 holds, but uh, you know, we're still. Uh, <laughs> We're still still gooning over here, um, <laughs> and uh, we'll just have to see uh, what happens. Still gooning next. after all these years, <laughs> you know. Another really big theme that I think we sort of explored in this is in this year is um, the interaction between Hollywood, Holly Weird, you could say, and the Christian genre. I mean, there was a lot of interplay. There's a lot of tension in the films that we watched this year. Um, I mean, on one hand, we watched uh, fucking The Passion of the Christ. Yeah. The most famous Christian movie there possibly ever was, which was also just a huge Hollywood like hit and talking point. Yeah, made hundreds of millions of dollars. Yep. And, you know, did so much for the Christian genre in general. and, you know, we watched that and, you know, we also watched very commercially successful films like Fireproof, which we already mentioned a bit, but films that showed 
from the other direction. So, you know, if the passion of the Christ was from the Hollywood side, looking into the Christian world, fireproof was the opposite. Fireproof was saying like, here's this little genre that could, and that, you know, with the right placement and the right production quality, like you can actually really cash in on this genre, yeah. make real movie money. So, um, it was, that was interesting. Uh, yeah, I think that movie made 144 million and was made for like half a million. Ooh, that's incredible. Damn. What's that called? The multiplier? Yeah. Multipliers. Yeah. I learned that from the fixture movie boys. Mm -hmm. They know everything about (laughs) cinema. Um, You know, the power of church volunteers. mm, Yeah, absolutely. Cut down on your budget. Mm Mm-hmm. And then, of course, maximize profits. Kind of a, with a different, a different twist on uh, Hollywood meets religion. That same week, uh, Religious came out. Yes, that is fascinating. That Bill Maher's uh, re- movie Religious, which was sort of his like essay, his meditation on the dangers of religion and religious culture, came out literally the same weekend as fireproof which was you know just by the numbers one of the most successful like christian films of all time um pretty incredible coincidence or or not i mean i don't know what was brewing that year uh yeah fireproof something i mean religious made its money back and then some there was there was a multiplier on that film yeah. but it can't compare to the multiplier of a fireproof no. um no. so you know, that was interesting. And weirdly enough, uh, we watched another film this year that came out within a week of those two as well. Julian and I watched An American Carol. Right. The uh, the David Zucker comedy lampooning the crazy liberals in Hollywood. Um, One of the last on-screen appearances of... Leslie Nielsen yes, and uh, the final on-screen appearance of Dennis Hopper. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Yes. Wow. Oh man, I should I should get them to play that at my theater. Yes, you should. <laughs> I would <laughs> go to well. the American Carol screening <laughs> at your theater. I will be the only one there. Well, I probably wouldn't be the only one, but <laughs> it would be so funny. Um, but somehow, Fireproof managed to have the most likable characters <laughs> out of all three of these movies. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that amazing though? All three of them within a week of each other in 2008. It was like late September into early October 2008. That was when these all happened. Um, I, I can't believe Incredible. it. Incredible. Yeah. Incredible. What a banner year. Um, yeah. So, you know, uh, Christian cinema is operating its own kind of mini Hollywood. And, uh, but you know, there's still a lot of interplay with the the film industry that everyone knows and loves. I wonder how this will continue to happen. I don't really anticipate there's going to be a huge religious film crossover anymore. I, I think that there will be high ranking, you know, maybe Christian films that make a lot of money, but they're all going to be like independent things now, right? Mm. Like. I don't know. Do you see any other? I guess like Lionsgate does these like yeah. mid-level religious films. I don't know. What, yeah, what, and what Sony do you think? backs some pretty big things hmm. too. Yeah, there have like, been some pretty like, I don't know how they've done, but you know, I see a lot of ads for the Kurt Warner movie coming out. I don't know about That's, that one. Uh, called like Underdog or something. And then there's a lot of ads for that movie Steph Curry produced, Breakthrough. But oh, the kid right. fell through the ice. So. Oh, yeah. I mean, they're there, ads but for they're not for really like, advertised as overtly Christian. Sure. More like inspirational. And our yeah. buddy Nate was saying the Young Evangelist had billboards up in Detroit. Oh, the Young yeah, Evangelist. Yeah. I want to see that so anticipated for me. Oh, God, I want to see that so bad. But these are like major studios making these, or at least distributing like... Right, right, yeah. Breakthrough. I'm already forgetting what we were saying. Underdog, yeah. Because Young Evangelist is clearly very independent. (laughs) God, that truly is so So, yeah, I don't know. Uh, Seems like they're still, you know, cast in a wide net saying which one of these movies sticks. Yeah. We'll see. There might still be some really exciting things to come. Maybe uh, an unexpected hit. Um, 
We'll just yeah, have to see. It'll be great. We'll have more stuff to talk about. Who knows what the Kendrick brothers are working on, too? I'm sure they yeah. can get whatever budget they need at this point. Yeah. Right. Yeah, the makers of Fireproof and many other well-performing Christian films. Yeah, I mean, so much more to say, you know, but I, I think that these were definitely some themes that kept cropping up in my mind as we were discussing this year's, uh, you know, a collection of films. I wanted to end our sort of like wrap up segment by talking about some of our favorite new characters in this scene in general. Last year, um, I don't know if you remember, I just re-listened to our episode, but we actually did a primer on like all the most famous names. Like we literally went over like David A.R. White, Kevin Sorbo, the Kendrick brothers, the Cristiano brothers. Like it was a very good like introduction to Christian film as a whole. Lay so, on the foundation. It really did. So, you know, I mean, there's much more to be said. We watched a couple Cristiano films this year. Uh, we actually only watched one Kendrick film this year. Um, technically two, if you count that Stephen Kendrick did the screenplay for Beyond the Mask, that Revolutionary War uh, film. What about Overcomer? Or was that, that was last, last year? Was it? Yeah, it oh, was. Man. Yeah, I know, right? Um, but... So, you know, those, those same guys, and I mean, God knows David A.R. White, we did so many of his, Kirk Cameron, a couple of his, but um, let's talk about a couple just new characters that we're excited for or that we just love from this year. The first is I really want to spotlight Ashley Hayes Wright. She is not a big name. But we just can't get enough of her work. We literally just for fun, not even for recording, just watched one of her films before we started talking today because we're just so excited about her work. Like, what can we say about Ashley? The the great homeschool director. She she makes real family films because she makes them with her family. With a real family. She, yeah. she has the coolest homeschool setup. She and her family make movies together. Yes. It's awesome. I said this when we were watching it, but I'll restate it for this, that it is wild to think that according to her bio, she started making movies because she couldn't find any movies appropriate for her kids to watch. And then you watch the movies that she makes. Uh, it's just crazy. <laughs> it's like her and her husband, like kicking Bigfoot in the face. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like their daughter getting like abducted by it. Like, <laughs> like men. Yeah. yeah. Almost be like almost being assaulted just by somebody. About, and then yeah. Like Fantasies in which their dad murders someone or yeah. something. <laughs> yep. yeah. yeah. It's amazing. Uh, he's almost killing himself every day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's awesome. Yeah. Um, but their films are really something else. Like, they they are genuinely very creative people. They see the world in a different way and they make movies that capture a really engaging spirit. Um, we watched one of their movies, Halloween Hero, for our Halloween episode this year. If I ever see you around this house again, because I'm weak, it's going to be hard for me to forgive you a second time. God, I could do a month of just their films. I mean, we'll see. Careful That's what you wish idea. for. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Sold. But uh, yeah, we just watched um, the, the Badge, badge the, Bible, the Bible, and Bigfoot. Bigfoot. <laughs> <laughs> that was the one Which we watched. about uh, yeah. the police being defunded, so there's no one to, <laughs> to kill, kill Bigfoot. Bigfoot. <laughs> <laughs> and it was unapologetically a Christian movie. Yeah. Like not even like dicking around. It's not even like jumping, yeah. like dancing around the issue. It was like... A Christian movie. They, they end had the a movie. biblical justification for killing Bigfoot. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah, they really did. <laughs> oh boy. Now Ashley Hayes Wright. As far as I know, we're the only people who are talking about her. Um, hope it doesn't stay that way. I hope. I hope her films spread far and wide because yeah. she deserves it. And they're staying prolific right now. They really seem to be like churning out a couple a year right now. So. Yeah. Good news. I don't think it's I'm going to... good gonna, time to yeah. go in the woods and make movies. It's yeah. safest honestly, place to be. Honestly. Mm -hmm. Oh, and you know, uh, similarly, so there's two great places, in my opinion, that uh, you can make a movie if you have this nearby. Yeah. There's the woods mm -hmm. that uh -huh. we are just talking about. Yeah. And there's the desert. Uh-huh. Yeah. And another guy we found out about from this year, Scott Hester, who right. did The Greatest Gift Ever Given. 
And most of that is in pretty well, basically all of it's in New Mexico. And we looked it up and it looked like most of his movies are similarly to the Ashley Hayes Wright family uh, in this similar location every time. <laughs> yes. You know, I feel like if Ashley Hayes Wright and her husband, David Owen Wright, if they're the kind of like woodsy, folksy, like working class aesthetics, not sure what they do, but they, they really dabble in these like working class, like aesthetics as if, you know, they're working the land and blah, blah, blah. Then what's his name? Scott Hester. Yeah. He's more of the like, not upper class, but more of like a, like a, a, a business type person. You know, he has like more of a desk job. Whereas yeah. David Owen Owen Wright, you know, would say he has more of a hands on job. The repressed job, but, desk jockey. Mm-hmm. And he kind of like his movies are sort of from this perspective of like the guy who just wants to be home with his family for Christmas, but he yeah. has to he has to He's work to drive and, an hour and a half. Right, he has a commute. Yeah, the thing there. is, he'll the, also do whatever his boss asks of him without questioning. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. So that you know that's a pretty interesting. Yeah, uh, we have we have the desert. A uh, commuter, and we have the the woodsy bigfoot uh, hunter, bigfoot hunter, <laughs> <laughs> and those are two of our favorite auteurs that we met this year. But, um, you know, another person who we literally spent an entire episode on this year, but is an auteur who we were actually really into before we ever started the show, but we wanted to use our platform and like tell the people about his work because he's amazing. That is C. Tom, uh, an incredible, Ooh. an incredible auteur who makes movies like no one else who's ever made a movie. And it was a pleasure to have our friend Lenny Flatley back on and watch The President Goes to Heaven. And Mary was a whore who slept with many, including low class carpenters. And Jesus is a bastard and a fornicating criminal who was executed. And Christianity is a religion started by a manic depressive called Paul. Which is as close to a Christian film as he's maybe made. It's yeah, you know, it's it's spiritual. <laughs> yeah. If you're already into like Tommy Wiseau and uh Neil Breen, mm-hmm. then this is your you're going deeper in the iceberg. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Like this is this is like real shit. Like like really like esoteric uh and and wild uh film. Um so, you know, you got to check out The President Goes to Heaven, you know, maybe start by listening to our episode. We really get into his history with a friend of ours who's one of the few people, maybe the only person to ever publish a piece of writing about <laughs> yes. official C. Tom historian. Yes. By default, which I'm glad he is because someone has him, Lenny and now us are like the, as far some of the few people like making critical yeah. work about C. Tom. So, um, yeah, I mean, his films are just like, like a a nightmare. <laughs> They're <laughs> like, incredible, really incredible. He he channels the confusion of living in our like detached and you know violent and politically like tense like society in this really fun. He somehow and gives way. you the feeling that you're watching a snuff film while knowing that you're not watching a snuff absolutely. Film. Yes. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah, there is a set. You are sort of worried, like, is, is one of these people going to be executed? Yeah, is everything camera? okay? <laughs> His films ask the great question, is everything okay? <laughs> <laughs> oh, fuck. Um, see, Tom could, could spend a whole hour talking about him, and we did. So, you know... The, the last person I wanted to spotlight quick, although, you know, feel free to chime in if if you have any. Um, one of the few episodes we did this year that was not about a film, um, we actually did a full uh, deep dive into the life and work of Gwen Shamblin Lara. One could be sneaking into the kitchen and having a secret rendezvous with the fudge. Who was really in the news this year after she and her husband Joe passed away in a plane crash. Um, There was some media spotlight on her bizarre and frankly cult-like ministry that emphasized weight loss and disordered eating um, as tenets of a strong and healthy life. And um, 
also her strange fucking videos that she made. Like she was actually a really prolific video artist who posted <laughs> things like they have a, a video portfolio of every wedding ever done in their church. And there's Whoa. like a website that catalogs them. It was pretty amazing. Like her YouTube channel is literally, I don't know about, I haven't checked it in a couple months, but as of weeks after her death, it was still updating regularly Whoa. with content from her back catalog. I swear to God. It's on just like an auto post thing or something. It must be. But like she would, you know, like tape her church services and put them online. Um, Looks like it stopped updating three months ago. Ooh, they Shamblin Lara. She I was just saying to Julian how, uh, how the when line. Shamblin Lara's YouTube channel was updating well after her death. Oh man, that's awesome. Um, yeah, it was dope. Um, do you remember that? those insane like videos she did about the growl. Like when you feel that true growl, mm -hmm. that deep stomach growl, <laughs> that's when you know to eat. And if you miss the growl and you can't eat within an hour of your growl, you have to wait until you growl again. And that could be <laughs> yeah. another 24 hours. So. You get to wait for stomach hunger. We're going to wait anywhere from one hour to 36 hours for this real true growl right here. That's right below the esophagus. And it will come approximately one to maybe even three times per day. You will feel energy while you're waiting. Hunger is located at the top of the stomach and it feels like a burning. If you cannot get to food when you do growl, don't worry about that either. It'll only growl for about 10 minutes and then it'll come back in an hour. Absolutely unhinged dieting methods. Yeah. Wow. Looks like maybe she's in charge of her own YouTube page because at no point does it ever say that she died. Yep. No, they... That's pretty cool. Yeah, dude. She will live on forever. God bless her. Yeah, she didn't die. She's in heaven now. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, we got to look back a bit on our year in films, but um, this is not the end of our two-year recap because... The best is yet to come. Um, we are going to present the second annual Golden Calf Awards. That's right. It's the Boys Bible Study Landmark Award Show where we give out brilliant, blinding, glittery, flashy golden calves to the deserving filmmakers and actors. You're going to love these calves. Mm -hmm. Put Stick them around. on your altar. Uh-huh. Put them on your altar. You know, maybe... Pray to it a little bit. Yeah, pray to them. <laughs> Go crazy. Come on. God's yeah, not worship working. them. God won't care. They're shiny. They joke, but they really do this in Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> well, after the break, we will be right back to present the Golden Calf Awards. Stay tuned. Stay tuned. Stay tuned. And a pink handbag, uh -huh. When you text me, see we use a pretty heavy protection Like a seatbelt, I don't feel like a star Cruising down the beach, I don't See, I just wanna feel sexy, then take a hot bath Well, Jesus watches me Give it to me, Jesus Hard, hard, hard Give it to me, Jesus Hard, hard, hard Give it to me, give it to me, Jesus Faster, faster, faster And we're back It's time for the pinnacle moment in the Christian film industry. Every year, the industry titans are leaning their ears toward us. What are we going to dole out this year? Who is going to get the coveted Boys Bible Study Golden Calf Awards? Well, um, how this is going to work, we've created some categories and shortlists, and any film that we covered in the year 2021 is up for being nominated uh, in these awards. So, you know, this obviously excludes stuff we've covered before. Um, we're just talking about stuff that Boys Bible Study has covered, uh, which is over 50. We did, uh, if I'm not mistaken, about 58 episodes in 2021. Wow. Wow. Um, not all of those were more on than there are weeks in the year. It's true. Yeah. We did, we had some weeks where we doubled up. Um, but oh, shit. I know, wow. right? And, um, Especially when uh, I was unemployed oh. <laughs> <laughs> because I didn't have shit to do. <laughs> um, but uh, I got a job now. So um, that's why we haven't done a live stream in a while. But I, I, <laughs> I, I hope we'll do that soon. Um, 
But uh, anyways, here is the first category. Uh, best nonfiction Christian film. The nominees are Religious. Boo. <laughs> Directed no. by Larry Charles in 2008. This is Bill Maher's filmic essay about the dangers of religion. Plain fact is, religion must die for mankind to live. The hour is getting very late to be able to indulge in having key decisions made by religious people, by irrationalists. The second nominee, Kirk Cameron Connects, 2018 documentary by Caleb Price, where Kirk Cameron tells you about the dangers of the internet. And some people that I didn't even know who they were, like, just telling me just your um, profile's dumb, like, just all that. And I was like, dang, like, I'm just getting it from people I don't even know now. Like, what the heck? Another nominee, The Whole Sex Talk, a 2018 sex ed series by Vision Video. Now let's look at desire. More appropriately, sexual desire is not love. Oh, this too feels like love, but not so much. Fourth, Hell's Bells, The Dangers of Rock and Roll, a 1989 documentary directed by Eric Hollander, where uh, a man with a mullet tells you why every rock band uh, ever is a tool by Aleister Crowley <laughs> and uh, Satanism. The punk music revolution made self-mutilation a pop phenomenon. It became quite common to see young people stick safety pins through various parts of their body or carve slogans into themselves with razor blades. That is a fun one. Shout out Brett Berg, our guest for that. Absolutely. A very fun one. Uh, our final nominee in the nonfiction category, Quiverful Documentary, uh, a 2017 look at the Quiverful, uh, you know, do denomination? I don't even know what it is, of Christians <laughs> that emphasizes uh, having as many offspring as possible, homeschooling them and keeping them separate from the world. I think that a lot of parents feel that they can't homeschool because they have been brought up in a culture where the education is left to the professionals. Um, and so because they don't feel like they are a professional, they feel incompetent and, and unqual unqualified for such a task. And I think other parents, uh, if they stop listening to those voices and, and, and the culture they're telling them they can't or shouldn't, uh, they would find the fact that they uh, have children uh, makes them qualified. It's, it's like their certification papers, if you will. Kind of fits in the sex thing. You know, it does, actually. True. You know, where yeah. do those kids come from? Uh, uh, where do they come from? Uh, we'll save that for another <laughs> Patreon episode. <laughs> Immaculate Quiverful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Again? God, please. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Why? What do we think, boys? Any any picks for your for I don't even know if it's our favorite, but what is the best nonfiction film? I think I've narrowed it down to two personally. I know I my, my favorite. Choice. Let's hear it. I gotta go with the whole sex talk. Hmm. Had a little something for everybody in there. There was a dramatic piece at the beginning. Mm-hmm. Lots of word clouds, <laughs> some insane statistics about homosexuality, <laughs> uh, that poor lady who was so repressed. You could just see and, it in her uh, eyes. She you know, like it had the alive. nostalgic element going for it. We have, you know, we, we live in the era of nostalgia and, uh, you know, it really brought me back to my own sex education. Mm -hmm. some throwback homophobia. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm, yeah, exactly. In 2018, um, what about you, Scott? What's your What's your top pick in this category? Kirk Cameron's Connect. Mm. I really enjoy that one. Delighted me. Thought about it a lot. I uh, loved the little the little segment where um, Kirk Cameron envisions envisions himself as a warrior type mm -hmm. going out to save his children versus a monster, a literal monster. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty amazing. You know what? This is going to be a little complicated, though. Uh, we're going to have to come to a consensus because my top pick was actually Hell's Bells, uh, Ooh. The Danger of Rock and Roll. I mean, it was just such a compendium of knowledge. And to me, it was just so amazing to see this guy look at the camera and be like, uh, the Frogs, uh, like a queer punk band, The Frogs album. It's only right and natural, like blah, blah, blah. And like going off about like Genesis PRage and like, uh, 
but also talking about how... such a good way to learn about cool bands. Yeah. Totally. <laughs> and he, like, literally had, like, interviews with, like, what, like what's his name? John Oates? What's Oates's first name? Oh, Daryl Hall. Hall. Daryl Hall and... John Oates. John and John Oates. Wasn't it Oates? Daryl and- Hall is the one who's a Satan. Or Got who's it. Really okay. It was, it was Daryl yeah. Hall. Okay. Yeah. That, that interview with Daryl Hall where he's like, I read the work of Alistair Crowley. <laughs> and then, and then it like goes on a whole bit about that. I just saw them at the Hollywood bowl. And really? did a blood libel ceremony oh. on stage. <laughs> that's, that's <laughs> fucked up. It's crazy. Wait, did you really just see them? I did. Hollywood I bowl? did. Was it good? Yeah, it was awesome. Yeah. I mean, I love Hall and Oates. Yeah, me too. Um, I've got to have to say, if I'm picking between the two that you mentioned, and if I'm going to cast the tie-breaking vote between those two, I'm going to go with Kirk Cameron Connect. Because, that was my like, number two. Very you know, close. It was, it was two, my number so two I'm, as I'm well. I'm happy with that. Me too. I I think that's going to be... points, I think it wins. Me my number too. two was Hell's Bells, to be honest. Mm, I, I think my number two is Kirk Cameron Connect. I think the points are going to happen. Yeah. I would say then the mm-hmm. Golden Calf Award for Best Nonfiction Film 2021 is Kirk Cameron Connects. Yes. Congratulations Ooh. to the dad warrior himself. And Caleb Price, his director, who also directed that weird fucked up short film starring him called like Come Home. Oh, yeah. Which is really bad. And it was that was one of my least favorite things we watched all year. I thought that sucked major. <laughs> it was not good. It was so bad. Uh, but Caleb Price uh, also directed that one. Um, Connect is work. amazing, though. So uh, I he clearly is very talented. But in our next category... The Golden Calf Award for Best David A.R. White Film We Watched in 2021. Um, I specifically did this because it was actually really tough measuring his movies against all the others. I was finding it. I just wanted to give Day R. White, David A.R. White like best actor, best director, like everything. Yep. Yep. <laughs> and it was getting right so thing. complicated that I literally was like, let's just make a category where we pick the best David A.R. White film and uh, we'll, we'll, we we'll, won't uh, make him compete. It's like, you know, having fucking, uh, you know, LeBron play in you know, like a middle school basketball. League, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, it's unfair. Um, the five films, uh, we actually, there was a sixth film, I say for a different category, but five of the films of the six films of David A.R. White we watched this year were Me Again, starring and directed by David A.R. White in 2012, the Christian body swap film where David inhabits many characters. Oh, my dad. This is heaven. Why is everything so wet? Next, End of the Harvest, directed by Rich Cristiano of the Cristiano Brothers in 98, starring David A.R. White as a Christian college philosophy student. You ever think about those verses? I mean, really think about them? Bottom line, when all is said and done, only a few people will get into the kingdom. And what am I doing about it? Nothing. Scott is. Or at least he's trying. Another Rich Cristiano directed film, Second Glance from 92, featuring the iconic line, Jesus, man. This stars David A.R. White as a kid who wishes he was never a believer. Hi, Vicky. Hi, Dan. How's it going? It's going okay. Boy, the Lord's really been showing me some good stuff lately. Oh, yeah? Yeah. I'd uh, like to tell you about it sometime. I think I'd like to hear it. Can I call you? Yeah, okay. The alternate timeline movie. An alternate timeline Christian film. Uh, Next on the list, Mercy Streets from the year 2000, directed by John Gunn. Uh, Split screen, David A.R. White as two twin brothers. One of them a criminal. What could happen next? Let me ask you something, preacher. You think people got free will? I believe people have the freedom to make their own decisions. But God has a plan, right? Absolutely. Lastly, God's Not Dead, We the People, the brand new 2021 flick directed by Vance Knoll, starring David A.R. White as his recurring uh, pastor. Uh, pastor Dave, is that his name? Is he a character named so, Dave? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> pastor Dave uh, is his character in all four God's Not Dead. And the only way that you can get more power is by taking it from someone else. And that would be all well and good if it wasn't for that pesky thing called the Constitution that keeps getting in your way. Now you hold on a second. No, I'm done talking to you. What do we think? Um, I, I think I'm between two once again. Um, who wants to go first? What's, uh, what's, our, what's our top choices for the best David A.R. White film? 
Man, this is tough. It's it really it's is. almost a four way tie for me. Uh, the God's Not Dead movie was my least favorite. We by can a rule lot. that one out. Yeah, we can rule that one um, out. Let's, I think that in particular up on my list. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Following that mm-hmm. one up after the Ashley Hayes Wright movie the week before, I was just like, yeah. y'all are really going to make a homeschool exploitation movie. Absolutely. There's yeah. there's like real homeschool filmmakers out there, dude. It's like Nicki Minaj <laughs> once said, you can be the king, but watch the queen conquer. Um, that's how I feel about uh, David A.R. trying to best Ashley Hayes Wright wow. uh, in a homeschooling wow. competition. <laughs> in a homeschool film competition. Um, yeah, get get one of your daughters to write the movie, David. Then we can talk about uh, oh, that'd be cool. who knows how to make a homeschool movie. Um, I'm between two. I'll just say my top choice. Um, my personal favorite enjoyment watch is probably Mercy Streets. Mm. Um, I just think that it's such good Y2K period piece. David looks hot as hell in both roles. He looks great. He smokes a cigarette in it. (laughs) (laughs) Um. And I mean, those are, that's basically my entire criteria for liking a movie. So, but also second glance, I mean, one of the most iconic Christian performances and films of all time, it launched David Arrow White's entire trajectory of his life career for cultural importance alone. Um, I think that it could potentially deserve the golden calf, but what do you guys think? This is tough. This is tough. Second glance for all the reasons that you just said, Ash. Mm Mm-hmm. And then I, my alternate choice is me again. Ooh, <sighs> me again is so good. Yeah. It's so funny when he's like, oh, damn, I'm a woman on accident. Uh oh. And then he's his son. Yeah. yeah that's yeah. For, for me. It's between me again and Mercy Streets. Oof. God, even if we like did a point assigning system to that, that's like they're all still basically tied. Um, yeah. I got to go with me again. Hmm. I don't know. I was bored out of my mind during Mercy Streets for some reason. Yeah. What? <laughs> hmm. Remember the Eric Roberts role too, though? Yeah, it's a yeah. good one. I just had a, you know, I watched that one on my own and that was a remote recording, I think. So oh, gotcha. it's like we were... really hard for me to stay mentally invested uh-huh. in some of these movies. When I <laughs> you needed a couple more David Ayer Whites on yeah. The screen. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> I feel like. Fair enough. Yeah, I think, oh, man, I, here's the thing. Mercy Streets is the better directed movie, in my yeah, opinion. Yeah, absolutely. Um, overall, better performances. Me Again is so fun, though. It's so fun. I think I honestly might like Mercy Streets just specifically for the Y2K look of it. Like, it just has that great, like, kind of sandy, like, deserty, like, look to it that I it really appreciate. Good. Yeah. I would be willing to call it for Me Again. It seems like that was Let's on our short list, all of us. And I mean, it's David by David. It's David directing David, st- starring multiple Davids. Yep. Yep. David, 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 David. Tommy, Tommy Blaze, Blaze wrote it. He's oh, in it too. Tommy Blaze. His wife's in it at the time, wife. Right. Shall we say the Golden Calf Award for Best David A.R. White Film of 2021 is Me Again, 2012 film. Congratulations, right. David. Way to go, bud. Um, in our next Won his cate- own category. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, he also hosted the show and uh, delivered the <laughs> <laughs> delivered the nomination. Um, in our next category, best secular crossover. This film honors films that are in the Venn diagram of Christian uh, industry film and Hollywood film. Uh, some of these we consider Christian films; they themselves might not. Doesn't matter because we're calling the shots here. It's our award show, baby. <laughs> the nominees for Best Secular Christian Crossover Film. Hellraiser 3, Hell on Earth, directed by Anthony Hickox in 92. This is my body. This is my blood. Happy are they who come to my supper. Next, An American Carol, directed by comedy legend David Zucker. 2008. The president's stupid. Our soldiers are thugs. The government's dirty. Our cops are on drugs. But we still like our co eds with blonde hair and jugs. And America's to blame. Third, religious. Uh, we already Ooh. talked about it. <laughs> but, I mean, here's the thing about religious. Okay, I'll save it. One sec. Next, The Passion of the Christ, the iconic high earning. Legendary Mel Gibson film from 2004. And fifth, Wakefield Pool's Bible, which uh, was uh, 
se- so secular that uh, it was uh, literally a porno film <laughs> um, from 1973. Sexier. So, ooh, so, ooh. I barely even know her. <laughs> 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 okay. Also, somehow the most biblical movie we covered this year. The, honestly, yeah, absolutely. The only other one that comes close is Joseph and Mary, which I'm sorry was like a snooze. I mean, oh, I liked yeah, it, yeah. but it was just so fucking stupid. Wakefield Pool was definitely more like tethered to the Bible than Joseph and Mary was, yeah. which is insane. Yeah. Um, if more Bible stuff was done in the same way that that final story about Samson and Delilah, yes. I'd be so religious. Yeah. Right. It looked like yeah. Evangelion or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Seriously. It's so cool looking. Okay. So here's what I want to say about religious. Was it, would I call it a fun watch? No. But <laughs> it's. You can say that again. Deeply culturally significant. I mean, the episode. I was going to say deeply culturally insensitive. <laughs> yeah. Which is true. <laughs> but I just like, I remember how fired up we got. That was probably the most fired up we got during a recording of one of our episodes. Like, I, I, I listened back to it a couple months ago and it was like, there's a point where we're literally all being like, and then you fight. Like, we're all yeah. like, yeah. like, our voices are raised. We're like very animated. You could feel it in comments <laughs> about it too. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, it. it is, it really captures like, the a certain type of America in 2008 that was like a broad cultural influence. And I think for that reason, it's like very culturally significant. It's like the um, perfect encapsulation of like the liberal mindset yes. of like, uh, we hate Christians. Like we truly love everyone because we hate Christians and we all need to agree that we should go kill brown people in yes. other countries. <laughs> Absolutely. That's why I put say, our differences yeah. aside mm-hmm. and fight the real enemy. <laughs> Muslims. Muslims. That really is it. Yeah. It's incredible. It's like, it's like, oh, I'm not a Christian. Let's do the Crusades again. Yeah. Like it's it's, it's <laughs> yeah. an insane film. So I, you know, it would honestly be toward the top of my list in this category, but there's two others that are really vying for my attention that were also just way more enjoy like w- films that I would rewatch uh, almost any day. Um, yeah. For me, those two are Wakefield Pool's Bible and Hellraiser Three: Hell on Earth, yeah. which is such a fucking banger. Yeah, I gotta go with Hellraiser Three. I yeah. mean, by far and away. I mean, I mean yeah. it was so much fun. Hellraiser movies are awesome. And, the guy uh, is hot, 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 as we know. Thanks, I'm not even talking and, about Pinhead, who and, is hot. But. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and thanks to our guest, Sarah Squirm, we're now in the SNL Extended Universe. <laughs> That's so. true. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so, yeah, we're basically SNL cast I, members now. <laughs> do you think, okay, seriously, do you think she's on an SNL because she did our podcast? You know what? Many you know, are talking. She has the power of God behind her. Yeah, that's 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 it. Really it's true. Many are talking about the boys' Bible study to mainstreamified alt comedy uh, pipeline. Um, uh, now we just need to get uh, you know Macy Rodman on SNL. <laughs> um, there we go. What what do you say, Scott? What's your what's your secular crossover pick? <sighs> Come on now, Hellraiser three, Hell on Earth. I think I. What's that mooing I hear? I think that's the sound of the Golden <laughs> Calf Award given to Hellraiser 3, Hell on Earth 92. Congratulations to director Anthony Hickox. We love your movie. I would, you know what? That's that's a great combination of religious and beautiful, and I would watch it any day. I watched the first two Hellraisers on New Year's. Oh, that's Eve. that's a great New Year's Eve combo. That's cool. In our next category, we're starting to move into the actor and actress categories. Um, I literally made this special category just because I, I wanted to spotlight a couple amazing performances and films that we might not have gotten to otherwise. We have three nominees for best young actor, best child actor. Um, and they are as follows. Oliver McKellips as the character Oliver in Red Big Fire Truck. So then who raised you? Well, it's it's been a lot of people, sir. Um, to be exact, I've been in one orphanage, one halfway house, and nine foster homes. I'm, I'm definitely a very lucky guy. Lucky? Well, I mean, yes, sir. I mean, think about it. Most kids only have one family and one home, and I've had at least ten, so. I gotta say, you have an amazing perspective, Oliver. A brilliant film about a young, uh, a 16-year-old who's aspiring to enter the military, 
Uh, in the meantime, he connects with his long lost military family by go- appearing on a podcast. Um, and there's a fire truck too. <laughs> um, <laughs> Chef's kiss. <laughs> absolutely. Uh, next on our list, Austin Johnson as Sarah from the girl who believes in miracles. She plays of course, the titular girl who believes in miracles. Um, uh, and ends up making a couple miracles of her own along the way. It really was God. And he spoke to me. What did he say? He said he'll be taking me to heaven soon. Look out for this kid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, lastly, in this category, Cadence Hayes Wright, daughter of Ashley and David Owen Wright, as Rachel in the film Halloween Hero, a film that she wrote Herself, I might add, she was 11 years old in 2020. Uh, She wrote and starred in. Where's your costume? We couldn't afford it. We're too poor. Uh, Where's your bag? Couldn't afford that either. Who's your parents? They're dead. Watch out for that kid. (laughs) Seriously. (laughs) Seriously. Uh, Watch out because her dad will kill (laughs) you. Um. What do we think? Uh, I mean, there's two I'm absolutely torn between. Um, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna rule out Austin Johnson. Listen, very talented, but it's just that the other two films in this category are such brilliant, like auteur pieces that really like fired up my imagination, and I can't help but marvel at both of their young leads' uh, performances. So, for me, it's between Oliver from uh, Red Big Fire Truck and Cadence. Hayes Wright from Halloween Hero. Is anyone leaning toward one of those in particular? I am leaning toward Cadence Hayes Wright because she wrote the movie too. I don't know if that's fair or not, but um, in a movie full of very weird performances, she gave the most natural one. Yes. And she's like 11. And yeah, yeah, I don't know. I mean, yeah, that's that's the one for me, Cadence. I'm leaning toward Cadence myself. What do you think, Julian? Do you uh, feel I will strongly? Be, I will be abstaining from voting out okay. of protest in okay. this one. Uh, <laughs> the greatest snub since uh, Adam Sandler in Uncut Gems. <laughs> you left Jonah Britton, the star of The oh, World, according to Billy Pot, when wow. was uh, oh, man. snubbed for Best Young Actor. Wow. Yeah, my question for you is exactly when would I ever need to know what the square root of 188 is. I mean, is it going to be on my driver's exam? Do people ask you this before they'll change the oil in your car or seat you at a restaurant? Oh, Oh, man. I didn't see that. I feel bad. My apologies This is a kid who got me to say on the record that I hope there's a homeschool shooting. (laughs) 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 And that is a performance. Now, that's what I call a performance if you can elicit those kinds of... uh, Horrible statements. You know, on the well, I, I think you are perfectly in the right to Adams of the list, Julian. No, honestly, that is pure oversight on my part. I totally would have added him because, you know, I almost um, wanted us to dedicate a segment to our, uh, our the first part of our discussion on Lenny Britton because I do think he's someone who's going to keep coming up. That's this is Jonah Britton's father, yeah. who directed. Um, look out for this kid's dad. <laughs> look out for <laughs> listen. Look out for this kid. This is dad, okay. <laughs> um, he made Free Lunch Express, the Bernie Sanders parody film that <laughs> I have not watched, but Julian says he couldn't finish, which is a lot coming from <laughs> Julian. Um, it really is a lot. I think anyone should be very concerned by a film that Julian thinks he cannot finish. <laughs> um, so, you know what? I, my apologies to the Britain family. Better luck next time. I'm going to have to go with Cadence Hayes Wright. She's deeply talented, uh, triple threat, uh, and that is um, writing, acting, and praying. And um, (laughs) she has a lot of movies to come. The Golden Calf Award for Best Young Actor goes to Cadence Hayes Wright. Congratulations, Cadence. Come up with the Moving on, we're getting to the big awards here, people. Okay, this is no joke anymore. The award... The Golden Calf nominees for Best Actor We've in a Christian film. We've displaced all the shelterless people <laughs> in Grand Central yeah. Station, <laughs> downtown LA. Uh-huh. We can hand out the big awards now. Mm-hmm. The act, uh, yeah, the nominees are Tom Sizemore as Armand in The Genius Club, 
uh, where he plays the uh, terrorist with the heart of gold. Um, <laughs> All of you have until 6 a.m. to find the answers to the world's problems. You must score over a thousand points. By 6 a.m., if you score less than a thousand, all of you in this room will go up in the explosion. Okay? <laughs> Back to work. Next, Sarah Lejeune. Oh, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right, Sarah. As Allison in the movie Fat Chance about a, an overweight girl who is self-conscious, so she poses as her skinnier friend on a dating site. What is going on? Okay, so you know how I signed up for that online dating site? Yeah. Well, I kind of used your picture for my profile. You did what? I know, it was stupid, and I'm so sorry. Erin, she said I didn't have a chance, and so I just thought that maybe if somebody could get to know me before they saw me, then maybe I could find someone. Coming up next, Dave Payton as the neighbor. That is how he is credited in the film, despite being a lead role. In the film Thy Neighbor, where he plays the creepy neighbor of... Uh, a young, hot uh, pastor and pastor's wife couple who turns their life upside down. You can send your wife back over with some more cookies. Uh, I'll, I'll help her make another batch. You have a blessed day. Once a week, please. On Thursdays would be nice. Fourth on the list, Travis Owens as Peter, the lead in Audacity, Ray Comfort's <laughs> film about a anti-gay Christian stand-up uh, comedian. Oh, I got a joke for you, by the way. Yeah. Knock, knock. Really? Oh. Yeah. Who's there? <laughs> Interrupting starfish. Interrupting stuff. Oh, come on. <laughs> Do you get it? Yeah. The closer. I got it. <laughs> I just um, pictured him doing stand-up. <laughs> Dude, from he, that movie. he is from the Jonah Britton school of if your face looks like that, then you yeah. should be in a Christian movie. <laughs> um, but uh, last on our Best Actor nominees, Lala Kent, uh, who would become a celebrity on her own terms later in life, as Heather in Pitching Love and Catching Faith. You seem like one who's a wagering enthusiast. How about if you miss this shot, you have to give me a kiss. What a lineup. There are some pretty Seriously. iconic performances among. Does anyone have one that they're just leaning towards straight up? I got to go with, uh, well, you know, I can't give this vote with 100% confidence because I did not see thy neighbor. You didn't? No, I missed that one. Oh, man. Yeah, so... You got to watch that, Julia. Well, I might be casting this vote in bad faith then, because uh, I am I was going to give it to Travis Owens oh, as he's Peter so from Audacity. Good. He's pretty good. He's just, he's you know, good. perfect in the role. My s Tied for second, I've got Tom Sizemore and Sarah Lejeune. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know why I picked Sarah Lejeune. Sarah other was than good. That was really funny to, like, look up that she wasn't actually that overweight. Fat, yeah. no. She actually wore <laughs> a fat she, I wouldn't that consider so her fat in the slightest. No, I agree. I agree. But she was doing the thing where you hold air in your mouth yeah. the whole movie. <laughs> Although, yeah. you know, I, I'll i give her second place because uh, <laughs> in a lot of those scenes, I'm pretty sure that fat suit was on backwards. Yeah. <laughs> and she still pulled it off. Yeah, she still wow. acted her she way still through managed it. to wow. show up and do the movie. Yeah. Um, you know, my number one pick is probably Tom Sizemore. Um, I just thought he was so incredible in Genius Club. Um, I don't know if he would technically be a supporting actor in that, but to me, he was the no, lead. No, he's he, the lead. Um, he's probably my first choice with Dave Payton as the neighbor as my second choice. I mean, that guy was really phenomenal in that movie. Like the way he would just sort of like, like buzz to himself, like non-verbally. Like he was really good. It was really fucking crazy. Like he killed that role. Whoa. And this is a guy who was like a mascot for like a minor league baseball team and has like a couple acting roles. <laughs> and this is one of them. And he was like genius in it. He played a, he was a mascot. Something like that. I remember from his IMDB. He wow. was like a, a team. I don't think that was like, that's awesome. I, he hasn't acted very much. He's been in a couple things, but he's not like a pro actor, you know? Um, that is interesting that you say that, Ash, because uh, Dave Payton as neighbor is my number one. Yeah. 
Um, Tom Sizemore Whoa. is my number two. I Oof. his role really delighted me, and it is like the Tom Sizemore role. But uh, yeah. he's he was a little. Um, you know how Tom Hardy as Venom is also delightful, but then you like think about it at all, and you're like, "What is that accent? What are you? Yeah, what are you how doing? How did you come actually. to this? Yeah, that's a really good. <laughs> kind of got the same thing from Tom Sizemore. Not a diss, just I, you know, I, I. Is it as good a performance when you get to do whatever you want, or when you have to fit a specific <laughs> role? <laughs> that's a really good point. <laughs> it's like, it's like when uh, when your three year old like scribbles on a on a you know, a coloring book page and you're like, wow, very creative, honey. Yeah. <laughs> um, I kind of want to give it to Dave. I mean, I know that, that Julian wasn't really able to like pen that in, but like, honestly, you really sold me on like inching Dave over Tom and he was your top choice as well. And I feel like two first place votes might edge him in. You know what i I think I'm I think I'm gonna cast the uh, the 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 vote as producer. Um, I'm gonna say the best actor role, the golden calf, goes to Dave Payton, uh, a, a true uh, underdog win. Um, you know, this is a guy who hasn't acted a ton, but when he's on screen, he makes it count with all of his might. Um, congratulations, Dave, on your golden calf award as neighbor. Moving on to our second last and one of the most important categories. This is the award for best director of a Christian film that we watched in 2021. <laughs> um, the golden calf nominees for best director are Gabriel Sabloff, director of the revelation road trilogy, which began in 2013. I'll be home soon. Everything's going to be okay. Look, I know it's not your thing, but, um, will you pray with me? Yeah, no, babe, it's just not my thing. Yeah. Also, Boys Bible Study esteemed guest, and I would like to say friend, although we haven't spoken to him in a year. But uh, Gabriel, I hope you're doing well. Yeah. <laughs> Big fan of his work. I mean, you it was live just like close enough to me. It's true. Well come by sometime. It's yeah. true. <laughs> And um, no, I mean, it was it was amazing getting his like insight. Please don't ever show up to my apartment <laughs> unannounced. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, next up, Ashley Hayes writes, uh, who we've already laid a lot of praise on during this episode, director of Halloween Hero. Um, in third, Rick Swartzwelder, the director and star of Old Fashioned. Uh, a a romantic drama about a man who lives by uh, his own set of rules when it comes to dating and romance. The ideal honeymoon. A cabin in the woods. A case of bottled water. And not a single distraction from building a foundation of intimacy with my lifelong bride. Um, the fourth nominee in this category is C. Tom our favorite outsider auteur, director of The President Goes to Heaven, 2011 film about a president who converts to Islam while he's in a coma. Just think, you were once the most powerful man on earth, and now you poop your pants. Finally, in this category, Mike Norris, son of Chuck, Christian film auteur in his own right, director of The End of Days, Global Catastrophe. I'm the only one that hasn't gotten sick. Sick. Everyone just looks like monsters. Started with my grandpa. He's got these bumps all over his skin. And my grandma. Everyone's either dying or dead. What do you think, boys? This is a stacked category. It is. It is. You know, this is the toughest decision. Yeah. I am torn between three. I am also torn between three. I'm gonna guess it's the same three. Um, but I, I think I really have it down to two now. Um, what are your two? Okay. So the three, I'll start with the three, the three of course are Gabriel Sabloff, Ashley Hayes writes and C Tom. But the thing with Ashley is I, I don't want to give her best director right off. Like I, I want to see where she's going to go because I think that her career is just starting and I'm really excited to take the journey with her. Um, it's kind of like, you know, you don't want to give your star student an A plus 
in the first, you know, report card. Could ruin them. Right. They could get too cocky, you know, blah, blah, blah. But I would have to say that, like, for me, it's between C. Tom and Gabriel Sabloff. Now, C. Tom isn't explicitly a Christian film director, nor is Gabriel. I mean, Gabriel has many interests outside of the genre, but Gabriel Gabriel's work is sitting right there in like the, you know, the the crosshairs of the Christian film industry. And he's done amazing things within the genre. So Yeah, he is he is David A. R. White's uh, number one guy as mm-hmm. far as action direction goes. So it it's seems- true. It's true. So you know, I I definitely have him on my short list. What do you guys think? Man, I I'm on the I'm on the same page as you, Ash. Those were my three as well. C. Wow. Tom, Ashley Hayes, Wright, and Gabriel Sabloff. Um, kind of agree with you for Ashley Hayes, Wright. I I love um her DIY uh, ethic and how how she can like just her creative workarounds in general. I think are really great, but I also am curious to see where it goes. Um, man, I think as far as actual, like intentional, smart directing goes, it's gotta be Gabriel, but C. Tom's so fun. I, I mean, know. I, who I, thinks I mean, to do, that's the thing, like C. Tom, who else thinks to direct like that? Yes. He has a beautiful mind. Like he, n- no one's ever held up a camera to, uh, to a room and to a group of actors the way that he has. Uh, I think that that's very remarkable. What what are you thinking, Julian? Oh, brother. This is so hard. Um, That's what, you know, being a cultural critic is nothing to say. Yeah, there's reasons to give it to all of them. There really are. Um, I thought Rick Schwartzwelder has a very, you know, distinct, like, you know, he doesn't have the catalog of a C-Tom, but that movie is a very distinct directorial voice. It's very well crafted. He he obviously really wanted to make that movie. Yeah, and it shows. Mike Norris, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, you got to respect a guy who insists that somebody rubbed some poisonous substance on the back of his neck because of a movie he made. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I agree, but I think I liked the movies he made before that incident better. Yeah, the poison yeah. really changed him. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta give it to. Uh, can I get split it between Gabriel Savloff and Ashley Hayes? Right? Hmm. I think you can. Nah, I'll just give it to C. Tom. He's <laughs> he's dead, anyways. Wow. No, uh, I don't know. I, I love you, Gabe, but I'm gonna have to go with Ashley Hayes. Right for exactly the reasons that you said, Ash, because. <sighs> You know, I think if you're the best director, you're the best director, regardless mm. of if it's your first time or your 20th time. That's a really good You're point. not wrong. Okay, everyone say their top two. Uh, Ashley Hayes Wright and Gabriel Sabloff. Okay. I mean, I honestly think C. Tom is the best, but I don't <laughs> consider that really a Christian Well, that movie. is the other yeah. thing. It's not, yeah. it's not really, I, you know, this is the Golden Calf Awards after all, and... Everyone, I mean, I just, I love C. Tom and I honor his work, but you know. But I mean, talk about false idols. Right. Yeah. Right. Who deserves a golden calf more? Well. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck. I think, uh, I think I also have to change to Gabriel and Ashley is my top two. Okay. Yeah. I really, man, I'm going to go Gabriel. You know what? I'm going to go Gabriel. I I have to say that in 2021, the Golden Calf Award for Best Director goes to Gabriel Sabloff. Congratulations, Gabriel. Come back on the show anytime (laughs) and accept your award. award. (laughs) We would love to have you. And we're looking forward to see what you do next. Um, And everyone check out Beckman. That was way underviewed. I don't know why. Yeah, me too. Me too. I I would have thought that that would have trended a little more. Um, But, you know, uh, maybe people just haven't discovered it yet. On to our final Golden Calf Award and our final hurrah uh, commemorating the year 2021. Of course, we're looking forward to uh, a bright 2022 with lots more films and fun. But let's pick right now the best picture. Golden Calf Award. The nominees are 
Audacity, directed by Ray Comfort from 2015. The film about missioning to homosexuals that <laughs> involves stand-up comedy, a lesbian elevator tragedy, and uh, classic, a, con- <laughs> a classic Ray Comfort <laughs> daxploitation. <laughs> like, really... I mean, I'm biased, but I just love this movie so much. For some, the legalization of gay marriage is good news, while others find it difficult to grasp. Regardless of what anyone thinks about the issue, gay marriage has become a present-day reality that is spreading across America. Second nominee, Extreme Days. We live in, we live in, we live in, in Extreme (laughs) Days, 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 Days. We're living, we're living, we're living in Extreme Days. Uh, Directed by Eric Hanna. You know, this is a Y2K extreme sports, uh, you know, iconic film shown in uh, many a youth group meeting beloved by, I, I will say uh, unofficially, this is definitely a listener's choice, favorite film. Many people, when we're doing live streams, just write in chat. We live in, we live in, we live in, regardless <laughs> of if the movie's playing or not. People love extreme days. I love extreme days. Third nominee, fireproof. Uh, of course, uh, a very important Christian film directed by Alex Kendrick in 2008, starring Kirk Cameron as a firefighter who jacks off too much. <laughs> because you care more about saving for your stupid boat and pleasing yourself than you ever did about me. Shut up! I'm sick of you! You disrespectful, ungrateful, selfish woman! <laughs> Fourth nominee, The Genius Club, a late entry into our year directed by Timothy H. A about the seven people with the highest IQs trying to stop a terrorist. Boredom. Back in the day, boredom is what motivated inventions like cars and planes and the telephone. Nowadays, boredom is what fuels Al-Qaeda youth to blow themselves up in the name of Allah. Final nominee in this category, See Me Dance. I just wanted to dance and hang out, Dad. (laughs) And now, all of this. Directed by Greg Robbins, Pastor Greg. A film about a beautiful... Oh, shit. We didn't really talk about Pastor Greg, did we? we you know, we talked about him a bunch uh, last year because of Christmas Unwrapped. Oh, so right. we did. So, never so, mind. No, we've... We, you know, we didn't... I thought he was this, introduced this year. We didn't in this episode, but... We, we, it's funny because I've listened back to some of our stuff and, you know, Christmas Unwrapped and thinking about Greg did take up a lot of our end of, of 2020. Um, yeah. So, you know, hopefully people will check out his other work, but see me dance, you know, it was a really good film. We watched it right at the beginning of this year. Um, but so it's, it might be a little more out of our minds, but I mean, that is one powerful fucking film with some great special effects. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's one that you show people and they're like, <gasps> you know, uh, <laughs> it's, it's a crowd pleaser. What do we think? What's going on in this best picture category? Well, one thing that's going on is um, the best movie about a fire truck is not represented here. That's true. In my opinion, that's do you red, think that was big a bit of a, fire truck? Think more that was a controversy. Snub. It's a snub for yeah, me. Yeah, However, totally. that's my number two. My number one is See Me Dance. Wow. It's a beautiful film. It is. A really powerful film that's like funny, moving. I mean, everything. I love the way it's filmed. I love the way that Greg Robbins acts in that movie. He does his typical like strong, but like like, like weird and finicky. Yeah, like, kind of goofy. Yeah, it's like he, you know, he is a stuntman. Like he knows his way in front of the camera, but he yeah. also seems to like not be aware of his body at the same time. It's like pretty amazing. Um, and, uh, you know, <laughs> she, it's called, as far as I remember, it's called See Me Dance because the girl wants a license plate that says See Me Dance on it. <laughs> yeah. Well, she dances too. She's right, a dancer. But- you know. But yeah, it's because of the license plate. <laughs> I think it is. And it's a it ends on Christmas. It's a Christmas movie. That's true. Wow. We could have done that. We ended up doing it in like January, but um culturally, you know, I think fireproof is the easy choice just because of what it represents in Christian film. You know, it's smartly made, it's it changed the whole genre. It also was the bastion of Christian truth in that godless weekend of 2008 when Religious and An American Carol came out. (laughs) Yep. 
Um, so it's kind of protecting us on the front lines of culture. That's like cult, the cultural critic in me says, like, I have to honor the most important one. My personal favorite is Audacity. Mm. It's just like one of my favorite films. Um, you know, I'm biased because I just like, you know, I'm, I'm gay and I love like gay interest stuff. And I just find the film like really campy and amazing. Um, it also genuinely disturbs certain people I show it to. It's kind of hard for me to pinpoint who's going to think it's funny and who it's going to like genuinely disturb. Um, but I'm sorry, the scene where the guy takes the out of order sign off the elevator and the lesbians get in and they fall screaming to their deaths <laughs> before, uh, before Peter can mission to them. And he's going, no, as the, ele- as the lesbians <laughs> crash, like, it doesn't get much more like dire than that. It's like, really great. And it's it is, so amazing. it is an hour, which is awesome. Yeah. It really packs it in. I remember like streaming that one time on one of our streams and I was just like, you know, people were sort of reacting to it. And, uh, when that scene was coming, I'm also, you know, when you stream, you're on like a 30 second delay and that part came and yeah. blah, blah. And then like 30 seconds later, everyone in the chat was like, no, like all caps. Everyone <laughs> was just like, no, OMG, OMG. Like everyone was just like, it's just amazing to see. Um, what do you think, Julian? Any of these five sticking out to you? Uh, I mean. Or any other snubs? Yeah, I'm, I really, I got to go with, you know, I'm torn between Audacity and the Genius Club. Yeah. Genius Club is another one of my favorites from this year. Yeah. Just because um, Audacity is the elevator scene. Yeah. Which is incredible. And the train track scene. And the train track scene. And, and the gas station comedy. scene. And the gas puerta. station scene. Abre la puerta. You know, forget <laughs> freaking uh, Genius Club. I'm going all in on Audacity. Really? Wow. Yeah. For really? the most memorable scenes, it's just nonstop. Amazing. Remember the guy doing the Homer Simpson impression? <laughs> oh, yeah. Like the the examples oh, of comedy that they use in that movie is like, <laughs> it's just awesome. It's, it's incredible. His, his big performance when he finally gets on stage is to yell, are you not entertained? <laughs> oh, my God. And like the crowd goes wild. And That's boy, are does. they. And this movie came out in 2015. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm going with Audacity. Second choice would be Genius Club. But yeah, since that doesn't overlap with anybody else's, I, I'll just go with Audacity. They're they're bangers. I mean, I love both of those as well. Plus Audacity is only 50 minutes long, so Yeah. Automatically any movie that is the shortest will get my vote for best. Would would that have your bless it seems like that's Julian in my first place choice. Yeah. Which I do think by points rules means it could be the calf nominee it's my favorite Ray comfort movie by yeah. a lot um you know what i i think we're gonna have to do it this this you know what i'm happy about it but it honestly surprises me in a good way uh, i'm excited to announce that the golden calf award for best picture 2021 goes to audacity wow by ray comfort wow you know, it's audacious a, choice. It, it really I thought is. there might be some recency bias where we end up picking Genius Club because it is right. great. It was great. And I, I do honestly think, despite we wa- us watching it recently, that it is like one of my faves. But yeah, Audacity. I mean, God, even the Ray Comfort interview parts, like he finds that one woman who is like, he's like, so you think being gay is a choice? And she's like, yeah, it's a choice. And then like, a, a, a couple minutes goes by and then he comes back to her and she's like, so did you know that I'm gay? And he's like, oh no, I didn't realize that you were gay. So he got a gay person on camera to say that being gay is a choice and I chose to be gay and that's why I'm gay. <laughs> like, I think that is an achievement in filmmaking. Like, you just will never see something like that again. He's a patient editor. He really is. <laughs> um. Amazing. Ray Comfort. Also, just his style of directing and filmmaking is just top notch. Um, Unique. Yeah. 
We watched Crazy Bible this year as well, which was not as good, but it's called Crazy <laughs> oh, Bible. Oh, yeah. Forget about that one. <laughs> There's some amazing parts in that, too. Like when he's yelling at that guy on the beach and he's like, <laughs> he's like, but what is nothing? <laughs> Have you heard that, uh, broad, uh, that theory before? Probably from Disney. No, that's that's so a, this nothing something. has got something in it. Is that what you're saying? Yes, even nothingness might have something in it. Then it's not nothing, Bruce. <laughs> you know, if there was a best title award, that one might take it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, well, there you have it. I think this concludes the Golden Calf Award ceremony, and on behalf of all three of us, I just want to thank you so much for listening to our podcast. Uh, we're so honored that you spend your time with us and I, we hope it brought you, you know, a lot of great new movies to watch and hopefully a fun way to kill the time this year. Um, thank you so much to our generous patrons. Um, we've been hovering right around the hundred patron mark this year, which is, I think more than we ever really expected it would, it would be with the show We're we're really kind of blown away by your support. Um, want to thank especially our patrons at the $20 tier our patron saints for their advanced generosity. Um, We actually have a new patron saint to add to the fold this time. Welcome Alexandria. They've actually been uh, a pretty strong supporter on our like live streams and on our pages and stuff for a while now. It's a pleasure to have them at the, at the $20 tier. Also shout outs to our regulars, Nicole, Marissa, Jeff, Jane, and Kara. We really couldn't do it without you guys. Thank you so much. Um, Our outro music is Oh My God by Mary. Uh, From all of us here at Boys Bible Study, myself, Ash, my co-hosts, Scott and Julian, for two years now, going on three, we would like to say, peace be with you. Are you not entertained? (laughs) (laughs) Forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. I feel your love in me, it's coming from within. Oh my God. My devotion is so unwavering. Divine emotions when you enter me Every day you take me high with your love